sometimes I have to reload the page for me to see that I'm live because li uh, <clears throat> YouTube doesn't do it. Welcome, everyone. For those in New York, for those in Michigan, it's very late. It's what time? 1 a.m. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Amen. Watch my God, my Savior King, Lord Jesus Christ. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Watch my God, my Savior King, Lord Jesus Christ. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Teeth the flesh to drink the blood of our God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of our God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of our God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. Wash me, what am I going to say, Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yeah, I know in some parts of the world it's like morning, afternoon, and evening. I didn't have time to do a stream earlier, so by the grace and mercy of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm here. I'm going to pray, ask the Lord Jesus to bless us mightily and help me. I don't know if you guys are aware of it. You may have already caught on to it. Sometimes I have a very bad lisp, lisp, and I tend to stutter and stammer, right? So sometimes it's very bad. Sometimes it's not as bad. What's up, my brother, first last? Uh, pray for our brother, first and last. Ask our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, bless him. He decided to stay up late. It's 1 a.m. He's tired. Ask the Lord Jesus to bless him with physical strength and emotional and spiritual energy. <clears throat> He's going to help me to help you. We're going to pray in a minute, but I want you guys to mark this down. Lord Jesus willing. How you doing, my sister Sonia? Lord Jesus willing. One p.m. Eastern Standard Time. One p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday. 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time, Michigan time. The young man who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist will be joining me. He doesn't want his face to be seen. He doesn't want people to know his name. That's why I can't do a stream yard and schedule it in advance. 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lord Jesus willing. That's for me tomorrow. For some of you, it's already Tuesday. He will be quoting from Ellen G. White's writings. He actually sent me an email with all these citations and references. And God willing, Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to try to put them on my blog where he's going to expose Ellen G. White as a false prophetess. And therefore, the Seventh-day Adventist movement is not a Christian movement. It is a cult that follows a false prophetess and has a wrong view of the Godhead the Trinity, the wrong view of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So thank the Lord Jesus for this man. He was praying that I would start addressing Seventh-day Adventism. And when he saw I started addressing some of their issues, he contacted me. He's been a godsend. He's going to help us see what we on the odd side do not see. She is a false prophetess. So I can no longer consider Seventh-day Adventism as... A legitimate branch of Christianity. So make sure you let people know and join. For some of you, it may be very late, early, I don't know. But it's going to be 1 p.m., 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lord Jesus willing. Tonight, we're going to talk about a lot of controversial topics. Folks, by the power of the Holy Spirit, there's going to be lots of spiritual meat, but it's going to trouble you, maybe even discomfort you. So Father, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. We love and praise and worship your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, your heart, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, Jesus. Cleanse us in the holy blood of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and fill us with the Holy Spirit. We love your Holy Spirit. We depend on your Holy Spirit, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father. Fill my lungs, my chest, my throat, my heart, my arteries with life, from your Holy Spirit, the breath of life, the health I need to use it, not to sin against you or cause people to stumble, but to use the health to glorify our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And please strengthen my throat and my voice, Father, and make my voice pleasing. Anoint my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your children who are gathered, Father. 
Abba Avinu, our God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Father, use my meager efforts that all of us, not just them, myself, will plunge <clears throat> into the depth of your word, the scriptures. Bring out the meat of scriptures to feast on the table of your word, the Holy Scriptures. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures, we'll become more like our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to worship the way your son, our Lord Jesus, worshiped when he was on earth, to love the way Jesus loves, to love one another the way the Lord Jesus loved his church, even our enemies, to love them the way Jesus loved them, to be holy and pure and righteous like the Lord Jesus. And Father, let the Lord Jesus increase in us more of Jesus, less of us, that the light of Jesus will shine through us and beatify us. And may your son, the Lord Jesus, sit and throne upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters, my angels. Wake to be with me, Father, and I ache to be with them. Watch over them. Watch over our loved ones. Watch over us, Father. Save me from stammering and stuttering and confusion, Father. Save me from distorting scripture. Perfect my ability, the power and strength from your spirit to recall scriptures perfectly and to live them out perfectly and to proclaim them passionately without compromise. All of us, Father, illuminate us to know what scriptures teach and live them out for the glory and honor and majesty of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless the internet session, Father. Destroy distractions of Satan and help me not to be a stumbling block to my neighbors, not to be so loud to cause them to stumble, but to be light, the light of Jesus before their eyes and the salt of the earth for the glory of Jesus Christ to, to draw them to the beauty of Jesus and not to repel them, Father. And please provide for us, nourish us and feed us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, Bobby. And set me free from all these satanic distractions and constraints. Loosen these restraints on me, Father. Give us perfect self-control over our sinful passions to die to them. So that Jesus Christ, our Lord, will be magnified. And provide for us, Bobby. Provide for us, Lord Jesus, Son of God. Provide for us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Loosen my tongue. Please, Father. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. Please, my God, Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name, in Jesus' almighty name, in Jesus' almighty name, purify us, one, my God, and save the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? <clears throat> Drinking a little coffee. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, okay, what was I about to say? Praise the Lord Jesus for all of you, and I want you guys also. Bless my brother, Al D. He's here. Al D, bless, bless him. Pray for him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for him, his wife, his, his children. Ask the Lord Jesus to abundantly bless them, their loved ones, to be in love with Jesus Christ. Because this brother came tonight and his beloved wife <clears throat> sent home-cooked food for me and my brother, Sal. And I don't say this enough. Do pray for my older brother. Pray for all my siblings. I'm the youngest of six. Pray for my nieces and nephews and their children. I'm the youngest of six. That they will all come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, follow the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> Fall in love with the Lord Jesus and be born of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm the youngest of six. I live with my older brother, Sal, Salim. Pray for him, that the Lord Jesus will provide for him. The Lord Jesus will strengthen him. The Lord Jesus will bring him to the feet of the Lord Jesus and save him from calamities. But I want you to thank Al for me, his wife. His wife had served up a home-cooked meal and sent us a huge plate of it. Pray I don't gain weight. I'm scared. I ask the Lord Jesus to strengthen me to continue to exercise perfect self-discipline and continue on the path of losing weight. Never, never go back to what I used to be. Please, my God. So thank him for that. And again, I pray the Lord Jesus will purify our motives, not to do it for the praise of men, for fame or fortune in Jesus' name. Which uh, reminds me. Robert Sugenis had updated, updated, <coughs> uploaded, please, my God, sponsors here. I told you I stuttered. Robert Sengenis had uploaded the discussion he did with me on his channel. So I went there and saw, and we had some tool of the devil, wicked, filthy demon, dirty, filthy demon. And you wonder why I get angry. Accusing me of trying to be kind to Catholics, to peace Catholics because of my, my economic status, that somehow I'm doing it so I can try to bring more money and attention. A filthy, wicked, demonic dog like that. May the Lord Jesus crush his mouth, convict him to repent of that slander. That's disgusting. One thing, and again, I asked Jesus to save me from my own flesh, 
save me from my corrupt motives, save me from being fake, and never allow me, never allow me to stumble because I'm not above reproach. My trust in the Holy Spirit to save me from myself for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you have people that know me here. People that know me. Here. Al knows me. He's been with me. He knows me face to face. He knows me from Chicago. He knows that by the mercy of Jesus Christ, the Lord has constrained me never to prostitute myself for money. Never. You know that, Al. He's been there. And folks, if I was doing it for fame and fortune, I would side on one position and toe the party line because the way I am, asking the Holy Spirit to guide, guide me into all truth, to be as thoroughly biblical and honest to history as possible, as Holy Spirit saves me from error, I have views that are all over the place that do not sit well with any particular denomination. Do you think that's the approach someone would take if he or she is looking to fit in? And make fame, make you know, become famous and make a fortune. I don't think so. So may God save me from that for the glory of Jesus. All right. Now that said, a lot of controversial things tonight. I'm kind of scared, kind of scared to give it to you, but I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me. Not scared because of backlash. I get attacked daily. There is not a day I don't have to go to my comment section. There's not a day that I do not have to go to my comment section, start deleting and blocking these vile demons who bark. And are brave in the comment section. So I get attacked daily. Comes with the territory. May the Lord Jesus thicken my, my skin. Tough, thick skin in Jesus' name. Take over my tongue, Lord Jesus. So I don't stammer. Right? So, but <clears throat> what it is, is I don't want some of you who love Jesus Christ to be scandalized. Because sadly, in American churchianity, the loudest voice when it comes to this topic is a minority position. I'm going to give you a link. Now, before I post the link, I want you to understand. I want you to learn something. There is a proverbial saying, right? Do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some of you don't know that saying. Bathwater, it gets dirty, right? So you throw out the bathwater, but you don't throw out the baby. You keep the baby and throw out the dirty water, right? This is a saying that means that... You can read something, you can view something without agreeing with everything said, everything written, without agreeing with a person's particular view. You take that which is true and reject the rest. It's There's another saying that says, you know, <clears throat> chew the meat, spit out the bones. Chew the meat, spit out the bones. You eat the meat and spit out the bones, so you throw out the bath water, but keep the baby. Okay, what does that mean? That policy has helped me by the grace of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to listen to a variety of voices. I even listen to Muslims, Muslim scholars on particular topics, you know, on the nature of Allah or the nature of the afterlife. Right to see what they're saying, so I can know how to refute their lies and blasphemies and expose Muhammad as a filthy dog of the devil for the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. But also, maybe their insights, because remember, all truth is God's truth. So, in these worldviews, these religious systems, they will have truth, and that truth is God's truth because God is truth. And that truth doesn't mean their religion is right. It means that they have borrowed the truths of God and made it a part of their religious system. And Satan operates that way. What does Satan do? Satan will take God's truth and mix it in with lies and falsehood in order to reel you in with the truth and then damn you with the lies. So what we do is we trust the Holy Spirit, the God of all truth, to guide us in accord with the scriptures, the word of God, which is truth, the Bible, God's word preserved. And then we separate the wheat from the chaff, the meat from the bones, the baby from the bathwater. Now, can I show you Paul doing that? Can I show you Paul doing that? Yeah, admins or mods, I should, do me a favor. When demons start barking and manifesting, get them out of here by the grace of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't have time for challenges tonight. Please. They know my Skype. Get them out of here. We don't want to be this. 
distracted. Let me give you <clears throat> biblical support for what I'm saying. That even the inspired apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ would quote the sources of pagans who worship false gods, but would cite statements from them that were true and Christianize those statements. In other words, take them back for the glory of Jesus, truths that they stole and mixed in with their lies. Can I show you that? Can I show you that from the case of inspired emissaries of the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, let me give you one example. It's all throughout the Hebrew Bible, by the way, but one example from Paul. Paul speaking to the Athenians, the Greeks, Athenians, right? Arop, is it the Mars Hill? Aeropagus, Aeropagus, Aeropagus. Anyway, Acts 17, 28, as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue to glorify Jesus Christ. Exactly, even Justin did that. Acts 17, 28. Guys, read with me. Read with me. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Areopagus. Areopagus. I used to pronounce it Areopagus. Areopagus, Mars Hill. Did you know that citation? Paul is quoting two Greek pagan writers. In fact, the second part even says it. As certain also of your own poets. He's talking to Athen Athenians. One of your own Greek poets who said, we are all his offspring. He quotes Greek pagans to confirm the truth that we are all offspring of God spiritually. God is a spiritual being. He doesn't sire children physically, sexually. He doesn't have sex. He's the one who created us and gives us life and sustains us. And he goes, even your own Greek pagans knew this. Now, can I blow you away? Mark, Michael Stark got it. Did you know that that second citation from that Greek poet, when it says we are all his offspring, the Greek poet was talking about Zeus. Did you know that? Don't take my word for it. Get any good biblical commentary, and you'll even, you will even be given the source. They even know where he's quoting from, who he's quoting from. So that part where it says we are all his offspring, it comes from a Greek pagan poet who said, we are all the offspring of Zeus. Now, why is Paul doing that? Because he's saying, this is a true statement. We are the spiritual offspring of God. But let me tell you, Zeus isn't God. Here is the true God, who is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are his offspring, not Zeus. So he doesn't deny the truth of the statement. He denies that this is true of Zeus. It is true. We are children of God. But Zeus isn't God. See what he did? You see what he did? Zeus isn't God. Okay. So Paul and the Old Testament writers, they make allusions to ancient historical sources. Things said about the gods and goddesses of the pagans that the Israelites, by inspiration spirit, <clears throat> adopted and applied it to the true God, Yahweh, in a polemical manner, saying, what you said about Baal is not true. That's only true of Yahweh, not Baal. It's all throughout the Old Testament. But anyway, I say that because I'm going to give you a link. Here's the link. You must watch this documentary, Marching to Zion. The reason why I had to preface and preface this is because this is produced by a group of independent fundamental King James only Baptists. Some of them are very extreme and hold to extreme views that I condemn. But like I said, I can throw out the bathwater and keep the baby, throw out the chaff and keep the wheat, keep keep the meat and spit out the bones. So what I want you to do, I want you to listen to that documentary. This is perhaps one of the best documentaries on what the Bible actually says about the state of Israel and God's view of the Jews who rejected Jesus. It is thoroughly solid. There's one or two places I disagree with them. Okay, I disagree with Stephen Anderson's interpretation of Romans 11.25. Be that as it may, the reason why this documentary is excellent, because they will accurately show you 
what the church fathers, even Martin Luther, said about the Jews. They were extremely harsh to the point that you can see why they're labeled anti-Semitic. Very harsh. And even the rabbis that they quote, because they quote, they interview, not just quote, they interview Orthodox rabbis. They are aware of what the church historically has taught. I'm not endorsing those extreme views, but let me again share this with you. I want you to listen because this will prepare us for that part of my talk when we discuss what the New Testament says about the nation of Israel, okay? In this documentary, they interview rabbis who hate Jesus, who know what the early church fathers said and Martin Luther said about the Jews because of their hatred and vitriol against the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And they'll give you scientific data. So there's a lot of meat, right? So don't let the fact that Stephen Anderson turn you off. Let me share this for many of you who've been raised in what I call American churchianity, where a minority voice has drowned the voices of the majority. Most of us, I assume, if we've been raised among evangelicals, especially Baptists, we've been taught, we've been taught a particular view of end time prophecy. And we've been taught a particular view of the nation of Israel, right? I don't know if you're aware of this, Christians. It just may shock you. Historically, early on, the church adopted the view that all the promises about the nation of Israel are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And those promises are now true of the church. There are no more promises for the nation of Israel. Did you know that this is a very ancient view and it was the predominant view? It even was the view of the reformers. And are you aware that it is still the majority view today? Do you know that? Do you know that? But the reason why you think the majority view is that God still has a purpose and plan for Israel is because the minority, the, the, the minor sect of Christianity has drowned out the voice of the majority. And they use emotive terms like Micah does, which either he's doing it in ignorance or he's being stupid, but I'll give him the benefit of doubt. He's being ignorant. So what do they do? They try to demonize you and vilify you. Replacement theology, brother. No, it's called biblical theology. So I'll give Micah the benefit of doubt. He used the wrong term out of stupidity, out of his ignorance. Because again, that's what the minority does. Tries to drown out the majority view and vilify and demonize the majority view without hearing them out, seeing what their case is biblically and historically. You get my point? And I don't blame them because I was stupid too and I did the same thing. Right, So, Micah, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Were you being stupid and ignorant, or are you trying to be nasty and demonize those who disagree with you? Which is it? And I say this in love, brother. And I'm going to go into the biblical case in a minute. Now, for the rest of you, not that my opinion should matter. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I believe. Not that my opinion should matter. Okay, brother. See, that's what I'm saying. You, I love you in, as my brother in Jesus Christ. But be careful. Those are what do we call. There are certain terms that trigger, that trigger negative responses and seek to demonize and vilify the other. Yes, yeah, see, Novia thinks it's replacement theology. And I'm about to replace Novia because Novia is a biblical, illiterate ignoramus who couldn't defend his position if his salvation depended on it. And I'll, I'll get there. No, it's called expansionist theology. It's called Jesus' theology. It's called Paul's theology, not your false satanic theology that you try to impose on Scripture. Sit there and listen, and you'll see. And then I'll challenge you to call me and address my case. But just be patient as I decimate your objections by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is where I come off as arrogant and proud because you have arrogant ignoramuses pontificating, thinking they know what they're talking about, evoking me to respond in like manner. 
giving them a taste of their own medicine, say, Sam, you're just an arrogant jerk. All right, may the Lord Jesus save me from that. Okay, now, let me share with you my view. If Novia is, is really a man, let him call me on Skype so he can see how he deals with those passages. Okay, but now, for the rest of you, my opinion shouldn't really matter to any of you. What should matter is, what does the Bible teach and whether someone is interpreting the Bible correctly or misinterpreting it. But again, let me share my view, right? This is just my view. Take it or leave it. I do believe that God still has a purpose for the nation of Israel. I do believe there'll be a remnant of Is Israelites preserved by God in every generation and brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ until the very end where that entire remnant that survives the onslaught to come will be engrafted into the spiritual body of the Lord Jesus Christ, being part of the church of Jesus Christ. That I do believe. That's my belief. And I do believe in what is known as historic premillennialism, that the Lord Jesus will return physically to the earth and establish his kingdom visibly on earth for a thousand years. And after the thousand years, he'll usher in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what I believe. But even saying that, there are many solid Christians, much smarter than me, that reject what I just said and think I'm wrong. I don't know what CC teaches. Oh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Okay. All right. So let me repeat what I believe. But guys, I'm not a prophet. I'm not an apostle. I'm not inspired. I'm not the smartest Christian in the world. And I say this honestly. So take what I have to say with tons of salt and don't make me more than I am. Because already I've been reading some comments from some people. Sam, we're going to vote you to be a modern a modern church father. A church fa I, I had some brothers telling me that. You're going to be a church father of the 20th first century. And then Sharbal and his love for me just told me, just told me we're going to call you Mar Shamun. That's what you call a church father. Saint Shimon. Guys, I know you love me and I love you. And I believe me, my flesh, may God save me from my flesh and my ego. May the Lord save me from my ego. Loves it. You know why? I'm being honest as a brother. I am a broken vessel. Let me let me share this with you. I'm a broken vessel. A broken vessel raised in a broken family. And all my life I have ached, ached for affirmation. The affirmation of my family members, the affirmation of my peers, even the love and affirmation of my ex-wife. And I'm broken. I'm not trying to appeal to a pity party and get sympathy. I'm opening my heart. I'm trying to be as transparent and as real with you, my family, whom I love for the, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of getting the affirmation love that I wanted from my, let's say, family members or even my ex-wife, what I encountered most of my life was abuse, criticism, verbal attack, insult, and consistent beratement. And so it has left me a damaged human being with severe emotional and psychological needs that only Jesus Christ the eternal son of God and his infinite compassion can heal me from and save me from. And until he does, I struggle. So yes, I love when someone praises me and I hate when someone criticizes me. But glory to Jesus by the part of the Holy Spirit, he constrains me from believing the praise. And I pray he does because the last thing I need to do is to get puffed up. And by the way, do you know why narcissists end up becoming what they are apart from demonization it's demons demonizing them narcissism is the result of someone who was either neglected or abused and so they overcompensated by making sure everyone made them the focus of their of their lives and if not they would then punish and abuse those people you know that If you look at narcissists, if you go back and look, many narcissists ended up becoming narcissists because they were abused as children and weren't affirmed. So what did they do? They overcompensated by now becoming narcissistic 
so that you have to love them and affirm them and make them the focus of your life. Otherwise, they will now abuse you and vilify you. Right? Is that clear? Yep. Everyone with me there? So, I praise the Lord Jesus Christ that in his love for me, he saved me from becoming narcissistic. And may he save me from ever having symptoms of narcissism and seal me by the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Because I'm already damage and I do damage as it is with my anger issues when I feel criticized or bullied but now that said let me repeat what I believe about end time prophecy and we're going to go into the meat I'm just preparing you I'm preparing you my belief is Israel still has a purpose to play in bringing about the physical bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ so that at the end, that remnant that survives this onslaught of the nations when the Antichrist arises, this is my understanding. Many Christians say I'm wrong. That's okay. I'm just telling you so you know where I'm coming from. That remnant will then be fully engrafted in to the spiritual body of Christ. Fully engrafted in into the spirit, spiritual body of Christ. I don't know who would be stupid enough, stupid enough to call me on Skype right now. Fully engrafted in into the spiritual body of Christ. And then I believe Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. And after a thousand years, usher in the new heaven and earth. This is my understanding. This is my belief. But folks, let me share something with you guys. Those of you who are aching and doing everything you can, aching and doing everything you can, to get as many Jews to return to the promised land. Do you know, guys, do you understand what you're doing? Those of you here who believe that Israel becoming a nation in 1948 was a fulfillment of prophecy and helping Jews make Aliyah, meaning helping them return to the land. You know what you guys are doing? You guys, under, you don't understand what you're doing, right? Do you understand what you're doing? Do you guys understand or not? No, I don't believe in a seven-year tribulation. I told you what I believe, and I don't believe in a seven-year tribulation. Do you guys understand what you're doing? Oh, Sharba, okay, good. Anyone have an idea? If you correctly understand your, uh, your view of prophecy, what you're doing is you are actually speeding up a holocaust of Jews. Because according to Zechariah 13, if you take it to refer to the return of Christ as I do, Zechariah 13, verses 7 to 9 says, two-thirds of the Jews will be killed and only a third will survive. So do you understand what you're basically telling the Jews? You're telling the Jews, hurry up already because we need enough of you to make it to the promised land so that two-thirds of you get wiped out and slaughtered for Jesus to come back. Is that the message you want to send the Jews? That's Zechariah 13, verses 7 to 9. Yes, that's what you're doing. If you take Zechariah chapters 12 and 13 and 14 as referring to the physical bodily return of Jesus Christ to Mount Zion, then it says that the nations will be gathered against the Jews in Jerusalem. Two-thirds will be slaughtered and only one-third will survive. So what actually, what message are you sending the Jews? Why don't you let go and let God let God bring them according to his sovereign purpose. Stop focusing about the Jews returning to Jerusalem. Focus on getting them saved because the current state of Israel is an abomination to God. Zionism hates Christianity and hates your Jesus. Here, let me show you the prophecy if you don't believe me. Zechariah 13, verses 7 to 9. Let me show it to you. And brother, use the New King James Version so the English can be clear, if you don't mind. Zechariah 13, verses 7 to 9. Sorry about that, brother, because I want the English to be clear enough for them. Let God use whomever he wants. Instead of you as a committed Bible-believing Christian, yay, state of Israel, come on, Jews, let's raise up money to bring you to the great slaughter, because that's what you're doing. Let God do it. 
So cry 13, verse 7, 9. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Now watch here. Read verse 8 to 9. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in, in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Is that what you're looking for? That two-thirds of the Jews get wiped out and killed and slaughtered? Because that's what the prophecy says. So do you guys really understand what you're doing and what you're saying? And by the way, there are some Jews who've caught on to you. Some Jews have caught on to you. I remember not too long ago, I don't know where I was. I was watching a session where a Jew said, evangelicals are not our friends. He came out and said it. In fact, I think he was a liberal Jew who's a Democrat. And I remember watching it somewhere, and he came out and said it. He goes, evangelicals are not our friends, because what they're doing is they're trying to get us to go and make Aliyah because they want their Jesus to return, but they don't tell you that they expect two-thirds of us to be slaughtered and killed for their Jesus to return. See, he knew the scheme. No, Garvin, don't debate me on that. It hasn't happened. Please, let's not get into a debate. Partially happened at Jesus' first coming, but its complete fulfillment awaits the return of Christ. It's the already not yet motif. Let's not get into a debate on that, please. You get my point? You caught a Catholic crusader? Because he knows Zechariah 12, 13, 14. Do you believe Zechariah 13? When the Jews are in their land, right before Jesus descends... Two-thirds will be killed and slaughtered. Yes, it's talking about the Jews in the context truth. Don't make it say something contrary. That's what it's talking about. That's the contextual meaning. All right? Everyone got it now? I don't believe in a 70-year tribulation, and I don't believe in a rapture before the tribulation. So don't ask me those questions. Guys, hold yourself, constrain yourself. Don't ask me these questions. We're going to get into the role of Israel. And what does the New Testament say about Israel? I just articulated what I believe about the nation, and we're going to use that as a segue to go into some meat. Yes. So, Wilson, don't be so excited to make it happen. That's my point. You're not getting it. When you're the, yay, let's get them there, then a sharp Jew is going to catch on to this. So, oh, so you're excited to see two-thirds of my people get killed for your Jesus return. Shut up about it and focus on Jesus and the gospel and getting people saved. You still don't get the point? You still don't get the point, what I'm trying to get at? If our understanding of how those chapters will be full, fulfilled happens to be correct, then God will bring them, but you don't have to be giddy about it. Oh, yeah, that's Israel. Let's get them there. Let's raise up money. Let's get them there. Because a sharp Jew who understands your eschatological scheme, your view of end time, is going to see through and saying, so wait, you're getting excited to see two-thirds of my people, two-thirds of the Jews killed, wiped out, and murdered for your Jesus to return. And you really love the state of Israel? You get my point? So why don't you stop being giddy about the nation of Israel and about the Jews returning to Israel? Focus on getting them saved because whether there is a state or not, any Jew who denies Jesus is going to hell who denies Jesus, his Lord and Savior. So you're not helping them. You're not doing them a favor. Right? And in the documentary, you're going to hear a secular Jew. Here it is. I'm giving you the link to the documentary again. Here's the link to the documentary. Okay? Watch the documentary, please. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Orthodox Jews and secular Jews, you know what they say in that documentary? Do you know you cannot be a citizen of Israel unless you recant Jesus and deny Christianity and become a Jew religiously? 
Israel will not give you citizenship unless you recant Jesus and the Christian faith and become a Jew religiously. They do not give you citizenship. It's in the documentary. The Orthodox rabbis and the secular Jew admits, admits it. You get it now? I am not lying. Watch the documentary. Don't worry about who's saying it, meaning, oh, Stephen Answer, he is a wacko. He's extreme. And I condemn those views where he's extreme. But not everything he says is wrong. He says a lot of things that are good. So be a discerning, critical reader and watcher. The Jews, not him. They interviewed the Jews, Orthodox Jews and a secular Jew. And they said, yeah, Israel does not grant citizenship to Christians. You must recant Christianity and Jesus and become a Jew religiously. And a rabbi convert you before Israel will give you citizenship. How many of you are okay with that? Gavin, I just shared it. Brother, don't ask me when I repeated it three times, God willing. Go back, rewind, and listen. Okay. Exactly. Life breathe, breathe. I want to read what you just said. It's amazing how Western megachurch Christians call Catholics Antichrist. Meanwhile, they blindly worship Israel who denies and blasphemes our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you. I want to kiss your head. Live breath MMA. I kiss your head for that statement. Right. Folks, you will see the hate one rabbi has of Jesus. In that documentary, Stephen Anderson is, a, is interviewing a very old rabbi up in years. When he talks about Jesus, look at his face. I'm not lying. Hatred, demonic anger and hatred the way he talks about Jesus. He said the Jews hate. I'm not lying. See the documentary, please. And that's partially why the church fathers and Martin Luther turned against the Jews. Did you know why? I'm not saying the church fathers are right. I have to admit, some of the things they said were very harsh and cruel and extreme. It was. But you know why they said that? And the, and the documentary will mention the book, and I have the book. There's a scholarly book written by a scholar of the Talmud who's not evangelical necessarily. The reason why the early church fathers and Martin Luther became livid towards the Jews is because of some of the things the rabbi said about Jesus and Mary in the Talmud. And it's documented by scholars who are not Bible-believing Christians. The Jews in the Talmud had some nasty th things to say about Jesus and his mother, calling the Blessed Mother of our Lord a harlot, saying that Jesus was illegitimate, because he was fathered by a Roman soldier named Pandera. And that Mary and Jesus are being tormented in hell. Did you know that? Yeah, here it is again. F. Mantega. And I'm giving you the derated word of harlot. Harlot. And if you want to see a demonic spiritual bastard, a demonic filthy dog scum of the, from, from the pit of hell who hates Jesus to the point of Muslims, go look at Rabbi, Rabbi Tovia Singer. You think if Rabbi Tovia Singer had the upper hand, he wouldn't be killing us Christians? Just watch the documentary. All right? Watch the documentary. Okay. So what do they do? American churchanity, these bunch of evangelic fishes, spineless cowards, fake Christian Pharisees who think they're spiritual and pious. They will then vilify and demonize people like me saying, replacement theology, anti-Semitic, in order to avoid getting their, their camp to listen to this side and hear the facts. Yeah, John Hagee is the biggest joke. He's the biggest traitor among the evangelical community. Because you know what John Hagee says? The Jews have their own covenant with God. They don't need Jesus. This slime 
evangelical minister. This traitor to the blood of Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus rebuke and chasten him. Yep, John Hagee. It's in the documentary. He's on record. He says, Jews have their own covenant with God. Jesus never offered himself as the Messiah of Israel. Right? Okay, now, with that said, this was all preface. Yeah, first and last. It, he's on record. He's on record. He wrote a book. He's done sermons. And they also will show you. They quote him in the documentary. He's a traitor to the blood of Jesus Christ. He, let me be honest. He's a Judas. Anyone who would say the Jews don't need Jesus Christ to have the covenant of God, he is a tool of the devil. He's a traitor who's betrayed the blood of Jesus. John Hagee. I just said it, Mayo. Don't make me repeat myself. Yeah, now Michael Brown is solid. Don't put Michael Brown in that camp. Michael Brown is solid. He does believe the formation of Israel as a nation fulfilled prophecy. He does believe, right, that the Jews will be in the land when Jesus returns. But he'll tell you, any Jew who rejects Jesus will go to hell. And there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. So Michael Brown is solid and balanced. And he's a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now that said, can we get into the topic? With that said, can we now get into the topic? That was all to prepare you for what I want to talk about today. All right. With that said, let's get into the topic. Okay. I'm going to talk about, briefly talk about Bible versions and how they impact statements in regards to our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I'm going to talk about Israel, and if I have time, about the Antichrist. That's up to you guys, unless you guys think, all right, this is too much. I can't stand this heretic, and I want to move on. Because you're asking me to give you meat and try to be as honest to Scripture as possible, whether I offend you or not. And I don't want to offend you, but I'm not going to tickle your ears. Right? So if you're ready, if you're ready, then please help me to help you. No side talks, no tangents, no debates, and focus, please. Focus, please. Can we focus? All right. That documentary, you must watch it. Okay. Let's look at why, again, Bible versions are important. Now, the examples I'm about to give you is not a difference in the text that they use. They're all using the same texts. It's a difference in how you translate the words. Okay. Can we? Can you guys focus? Can you help me now? Let's now get into this point. Let's refocus and get into this point about Bible versions and the impact they have in our view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, let's focus, please. Help me to help you. I want to bless you as long as God sanctifies me for the glory of Jesus and fills me with the Spirit to never shame Jesus. I will keep serving you and teaching you until the Lord says, time to come home. Okay, now. These examples, they're very few. They're not many today. Are not based on different readings in the manuscript tradition. The examples I'm about to give you are all based on the same manuscripts. The manuscripts read the same. So they're translating the same Greek text. It's how they decide to translate the Greek. Are you, re are you ready? You guys ready? See, we're still talking about Sid Roth, you see? People can't constrain themselves. Okay, are you ready? All right. But let me give you some articles before I go. Now, guys, in this first part, I link to a series of responses I did to Shibra Ali and other Muslims. You must read those series of rebuttals to Shibra Ali and other Muslims. It's in this article. I link to them. It's a six-part series of responses to Shibrali, right, and other Muslims, and it has to do with the example I'm about to set forth. So here's part one. In part one, you'll find the six-part series of rebuttals to Shibrali and other Muslims in respect to this passage that I'm about to mention. So that's part one. You have my full permission to take all my articles, upload them, print them out, even my YouTube sessions, translate them, for the glory of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, for the glory of Jesus Christ. As long as you do it free, 
and don't charge. Okay, that's part one. Here's the link again. Here's the link again. Now here's part two. Now we'll be ready. Part two. Okay, part two. Now with that said, save the links. Save the links. Now let's begin to discuss. Let me get this out of the way. Let me just get this out of the way so it doesn't distract me. Okay, here it is. We're going to now compare Dewey Reigns, Authorized King James Version, and New King James Version, not the NIV. Dewey Reigns, Authorized King James Version, and New King James Version. And you'll see, I'm going to give you the link. You can click on it. I'm going to give you a link. You can click on it. It has to do with statements in the book of Acts. Here it goes. Click on the link. It's four passages in the book of Acts. Click on the link. Acts 3.13, Acts 3.26, Acts 3.13, Acts 3.26, Acts 4.27, and Acts 4.30. Acts 3, verse 13, Acts 3, verse 26, right? Acts 4.27 and Acts 4.30. Okay, so we're going to look at how the authorized King James Version, New King James Version, translates the Greek. They're translating the same Greek. It's the same Greek text. And the Dewey Reigns is translating the Latin version of the Greek. So don't forget, the Dewey Reigns is an English translation of the Latin Vulgate. And the Latin was translated from the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. So now let's look at the authorized King James Version. Okay? Please help me help you. You're going to get a lot of meat, I promise you. And guys, I, maybe I don't say it enough. I know who the regulars are because you've been with me over the years. And even some recent ones who have become regulars. I now know who you are. I see you often. And I want you to know I consider you my family my spiritual family, and it's an honor that the Lord Jesus would use me to bless you, and I love you for the sake of Jesus. If I offend you, please forgive me. Don't take it personally, because I am a sick sinner who can lose patience in my testimony. But no, you are a blessing to me, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing these sessions. So you are blessing me by coming here, allowing me to be used of the Lord to bless you, and I love you for the sake of Jesus. Right? I do, because I know who you are. I see your names, and I can tell who the regulars are from those who are just here to fight and debate and cause me to sin and stumble. Yep, thank you, Aldi. Emphasis on sick. But I am one gorgeous, handsome, sick puppy. All right, now, let's look at the first example. Don't forget, New King James, King James are translating the same Greek text. It's not a variant in the manuscripts. Dewey Reigns is translating from the Latin translation of the Greek. Let's start with the authorized King James Version. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, Jesus. Authorized King James Version. Glorified his son, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So here, God glorified his son, Jesus. Dewey reigns to your left, Acts 3.13. The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you indeed delivered up and denied before the face of Pilate. When he, ju when he judged, he should be released. New King James, based on the same Greek text of the King James, New King James, Acts 3.13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, Glorify his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So did God glorify his son or his servant? Cross fixo. Why would you have to tell me you disagree with me in a few things? Can't you just keep it to yourself? I don't want you to blindly follow me, but to tell me that you disagree with me means you just want to make sure that I know you disagree. Why? Okay, but anyway, for the rest of you, New King James, same Greek text, same Greek text, says God glorified a servant. King James, God glorified a son. Dewey Reigns, God glorified a son. Now, the reason why the Dewey Reigns is important, because the Latin understood the Greek to mean son. 
Now, first last, can you put the Latin for Acts 313 or no? Can you or you can't? If not, I'll just get the Latin. Dus Abraham et Dus. Now, guys, I'm going to butcher the Latin. Thank you, Roger. God bless you. Dus Abraham et Dus. Isaac et Dus. Jacob Dus. Pa, uh, patrum Nostroror. No, <laughs> nostrorum. Glori, glorificavit. Filium. That's the word son. Filium. You see the word filium? That means Jerome, when he translated the Greek into Latin, understood the Greek to mean son, filium. So the Latin is an ancient witness that, at least in the case of Jerome, he took the Greek to mean son, not servant. Yep, St. Jerome. You got it? Let's move on to the other example. Acts 3.26. Acts 3.26, King James, unto you first, God having raised up his son, Jesus, raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Dewey Rames, to you first, God, raising up his son, raising up his son, hath sent him to bless you that everyone may convert himself from his wickedness. New King James, to you first, God, having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Now, the Latin again says, it's, it's a Latin word for son, phileus. So the Latin understood the Greek to mean son. And I'll show you what the Greek is. Let's go to the next two examples. So, folks, it's not an issue of a variant in the manuscripts. It's the same Greek text that the New King James, King James are translating from. It's an issue of how to translate the Greek word. See, again, he gave you the Latin. Notice the word filium. Filium. That is the Latin for son. You see it? What is your opinion if I block you for asking about Zoroaster? Do you have an opinion on that? All right. Acts 4.27, the two final examples. Acts 4.27, authorized King James Version. For of a truth against thy holy child, holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. Dewey Rames, for a truth, they're assembled together in the city against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. New King James, for truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Okay, now let's go to the final example. Acts 4.30, Now I love this. Why? Because I want you to notice by whose authority, by whose power the apostles are doing miracles. By whose authority... By whose power did the apostles go around doing the miracles? Healings, spiritually and physically, giving sight physically, raising the dead physically, and spiritually. By whose authority? By whose power? Watch. Acts 4.30, King James. By stretching, stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Wow. We are going to do signs and wonders, Father, by the name, by the authority, by the power of your holy child, Jesus. Do your aims. By stretching forth thy hand, meaning your power to, to cures, signs and wonders to be done by the name of thy holy son, Jesus. New King James. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy Holy servant, Jesus. Acts 4.30 is powerful. Because it's saying the apostles knew and recognized. They did signs, wonders, and healings by the power of the Father and his holy child, Jesus Christ. 
showing the Father and the Son are essentially equal. Acts 4.30 is another passage testifying to the unity of the Father and Jesus, that they are one in essence because it's their power that the apostles invoked to do the miracles they did. So now you're asking me why the New King James, by the way, NIV also translates it as servant, as does ESV. But here I want to shock you Catholics. Catholics, you ready to get shocked? You and me are both going to see how the New American Bible, Revised Edition, a Catholic edition, renders it. I'm not aware of how it renders it, but any bets that the New American Bible renders it as servant? Any bets that the New American Bible renders it as, as servant? Now, I haven't checked. We're going to check it together. Do me a favor, first last. Can you post Acts 4.30 in the New American Bible, Revised Edition, a Catholic edition? Acts 4.30. Any bets? Even the Revised Standard Version says, Servant. Did you catch it, Catholics? Your New American Bible Revised Edition, your holy servant Jesus. Servant Jesus. Guess how the Jehovah Witness Bible renders it? Servant Jesus. What about Acts 4, 27 in the New American Bible? Take it easy, F. Jacob. Take it easy, man. Take it easy. They're true Catholics who truly love Jesus Christ, and they would acknowledge that there are popes who are evil, but it doesn't mean the Catholic Church is evil. So take it easy, man. Take it easy. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, Acts 4.27, New American Bible Revised Edition. Indeed, they gathered in the city against your holy servant. Catholics, are you disappointed that the very addition that is approved by the United, is it the United Council of, or the Council of, of uh, what is it, Catholic Bishops, United Council of Catholic Bishops, United States, whatever, there's, this is the Bible they approve of? No, they're not evil, Yonatan. Calm down, guys. Calm down. Denis, yes, the Jerusalem Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible those are Catholic editions, and New Jerusalem Bible is actually has been revised. But in America, Denny uh, Domingos, the Jerusalem New Jerusalem Bible are not popular anymore. In America, the yeah, United States USCCB. In America, the Catholic bishops of the United States they endorse the New American Bible, and I actually have. Uh, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible. Do you guys want me to see how it reads there? You want me to show you how it reads there? Let's look at the two other examples from the New American Bible. Okay, I will. I'll show it to you. New American Bible, Revised Edition, Acts 3.13 and 26. Acts 3.13 and 26. I just bought it from Barnes & Noble a couple weeks ago. Acts 3.13 and 26. New American Bible, Revised Edition. Watch here. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over. His servant Jesus, whom you handed over. And denied in Pilate's presence when he decided to release him. Now, Acts 3.26. For you first, for you first, you Jews first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless, bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Hmm. What about the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a Catholic edition, revised edition? Let's see. The revised New Jerusalem Bible. The New Jerusalem Bible has been revised. The revised New Jerusalem Bible. Here you go. The revised New Jerusalem Bible. New Jerusalem Bible revised. Uh, a study edition. I'll get there. Pretty. Just be patient, guys. Man, you guys are not patient. All the information why I posted in those series of articles. There are eight articles in total. You got to read all eight. Do you know why you got to read all eight? You know why? 
Anti-Trinitarians, specifically Muslims of Shibrali, have caught on to the difference. Shibrali uses the difference to show how Bibles are coming closer to Islam in the sense that what at once said Jesus is God's son is now changed to Jesus being God's servant. Do you know that? That's why I wrote the series of rebuttals. But now let's go to New Jerusalem Bible. It's revised edition. The revised New Jerusalem Bible. Acts, here you go. The problem is they don't have versification, do they? Hold on, let me see. Here you go. There you go. Acts 3, 13. Let's see. The God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus. Has glorified his servant Jesus. You can't see it, but here it says servant. Okay? Servant. Note, see. Here's a note. An early Christological title presenting Jesus as the fulfillment of the servant in Isaiah 53 Quoted also in 8.32.33, it occurs also in Romans 4.25, 8.32, Philippians 2.7, okay? Acts 3.26, Acts 3.26. Now, this one is interesting. Notice this one, though. For you, in the first place, God raised up his son. Isn't that ironic? In 26, the same Greek word, they rendered here as son, isn't that ironic? Why here in 13, servant, and over here, son, when it's the same Greek word? Interesting. Acts 4.27. Let's see how it renders it there. In the city, they have truly come together against your servant, Jesus. So in Acts 4.27, the same Greek word, servant again. So one place servant, other place son. Over here, it's servant. What about Acts 4.30? Stretching out your hand for healing and signs and wonders to happen through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Holy servant, Jesus. Wait, wait. So in Acts 3.13, Acts 4.27, Acts 4.30, it's servant. And Acts 3.26, it's son, though it's the same Greek word. There you go. Can someone tell me why? Three out of the four places it's servant, but only one time they translate it as son. Why? Now, why is it New King James, King James, translating the same Greek? It's the same Greek. It's not a variant. It's the same Greek. Decided to translate it differently. Let me show you now. Let me get you the link. Okay, here's the link. You don't need to read Greek. You can see it. Let me give it to you. Okay, here you go. Sorry, let me get there. Hold on. Here you go, guys. Yeah, by the way, Sonia, can you check the Italian, Sonia? Because you read Italian, right? Click on it. You'll see what the word translated servant happens to be. Okay, let's see. It's the word paida, paida. Do you see it? Hagion paida, servant. When you click on it here, you'll see paida comes from pais, pais. Paida comes from pais. Okay, now why is that important? You'll see it there. I gave it. A child, boy, youth. You see it? Child, boy, youth. It's right there. Original word, pais, paidas. And this is the word in all other in all the other places. It's the same, it's basically the same Greek word. Noun feminine, noun masculine. Pais, child, boy, youth, a male child, boy, a male slave, servant, thus the servant of God, especially as the title of Messiah, a female child, girl. The word paida is where you get the word pedophilia. Where you get the word pediatrician. What is a pediatrician? A child doctor. What is pedoph pedophilia? Phileo paida, love of a child. So the word paida or pais can mean, does mean child and son. 
but it is used of a servant as well. So in the series of articles I wrote, I showed why the word pais and paida were used of Jesus in Acts. Because it means he is the servant of Isaiah 53, but he's more than a servant. He is God's holy son, holy child, who became his servant. So it shouldn't just be rendered servant. It should be rendered in such a way where the notion is retained. He is God's son, God's child, who's become his servant. Is that clear? So it's not simply servant. Because if it was servant, the inspired author could have used doulos. He used pais and paida. Because pais and paida means more than a servant. It means a child and a son who serves. You get my point? Why would Jesus choose a denomination when he's the God of all Christians and all churches? You get my point, Rusty? Yes. That's why, Rusty, the inspired authors didn't simply use the word doulos. Doulos means servant or slave. They use pais, paida, because it's more than simply a servant. It's a child and a son who serves. So I think that it's more appropriate to retain the definition son, child, instead of simply saying servant, because servant loses the fact that he is a beloved, dear child, beloved, dear son who's serving. You get it now? So again, I go with the King James and the Dewey Rames. I still don't know what you're talking about. It's necessarily last supper apologetics. I have no idea what you're talking about. And if you're trying to debate me, I don't know why, but last supper apologetics. Let me help you. Let me, let me expand your knowledge a little bit. If the inspired text wanted to merely convey, he's a servant. It could have used the word doulos. The fact that pais Paida was used is deliberate because it shows he's more than a servant. He is the son, the holy child who serves to the point of dying to bring about the will of his father. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. And moreover, moreover, last apologetics. By rendering it as servant, you now have less cases in the book of Acts where Jesus is called the son and child of God. Did you know that? Did you know if you render the, these four places as servant, that means you have now four less witnesses in Acts to Jesus being called God's son. The only other two places you have, if you go with the modern versions, would be Acts 9.20 and Acts 13.33, where there Jesus is called the son of God using the word weus, weos. And that's exactly the argument of Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali, his argument is, it's not until Acts 9.20 with Paul's preaching that Jesus is said to be the Son of God. Reef, get this guy out of here. Did your mother really give birth to you in a doghouse with the Shia present? So you may not see it as a big deal, which means you're not doing apologetics. Because if you're doing apologetics, it is a big deal to those enemies of the gospel like Shabrali who try to use this as a weapon to show that our Bibles are corrupt, not reliable, and that Acts doesn't have much to say in regards to Jesus being the Son of God. And yet you call yourself apologetics, which I'm assuming you're doing apologetics. Isn't it sad that someone says uh, part of his name is apologetics? You would think he's done enough apologetics with anti-Trinitarians, especially Muslims, to know they use this as an argument to show that in the book of Acts, which records the preaching of the apostles and establishing the church, 
They rarely, if at all, refer to Jesus as Son of God. Go figure. Thank you, House of Sophia. And then if you call into question Acts 8.37, guess what? Take away Acts 3.13, Acts 3.26, Acts 4.27, Acts 4.30, and Acts 8.37, these five references, you're only left with two references to Jesus being the Son of God, and both references are from Paul. And one of the arguments of Shabir Ali is that it's Paul who went around proclaiming that Jesus is God's son. Do you know that? I'm not making it up. In the links, I quote him saying that. Let me show you the two references where indisputably Jesus is called God's son. And it's found in all the versions. The two references in Acts. Acts 9.20. Acts 9.20. Exactly, Madonna. Let me repeat your words. No wonder they hated St. Paul. Exactly. And straight away, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he's the son of God. Who? Paul did after he converted. Now, Acts 13.32-33. Acts 13.32-33. Acts 13, 32 to 33. And we, this is Paul preaching, and we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, and as is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Folks, do you know, let me repeat again, I'm going to prove it to you. If you translate Acts 3.13, Acts 3.26, Acts 4.27, Acts 4, verse 30, as servant, you only have two undisputed references to Jesus as the Son of God in the book of Acts, both of which come from Paul, both of which are years after his resurrection. That's what I just said. Kenneth, are you listening, my brother? You're killing me now. I just said, Pice means a son, a child who serves. Because he's an obedient son. I just said that. So I don't know where you were at, brother. Of course, we know he's a servant, Last Supper Apologetics. No one is denying he's a servant. But there is a word used to call him servant. Servant, doulos. You get my point? Let me repeat again. If you translate Acts 3.13, Acts 3.26, Acts 4.27, Acts 4.30 as servant, and you question Acts 8.37, you only have two indisputable references to Jesus being called the Son of God in the book of Acts, which is an inspired chronicle of the historical exploits of the apostles as they went around preaching, doing miracles, and establishing the church only two times in this record of the early church and the apostles, how they went about converting and building the church. Only two references from Paul identifying Jesus as God's son years after his resurrection. And that's the point of someone like Shabir Ali. His point is, the early apostles did not go around calling Jesus the Son of God until Paul's conversion. Moshe, your mother needs to be thrown in jail for giving birth to a fake, self-righteous pig and swine like you who thinks he's spiritual, but he is a filthy tool of the devil, an arrogant slime. We should need to throw your mother in jail. So now question me and say I don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to lose sleep because of you. Everyone got it now? Because you can't have the Holy Spirit insult mothers. Okay. Holy Spirit, forgive me and transform me for the glory of Jesus. And I pray I belong to you and you're filling me. I just wanted to prove he's a liar. Because he thinks he's God. 
to determine who has and who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. See, that's why I did it. It's so according to him, I don't have the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the word pais, paida, that's where we get the words. That's where we get the words. Pediatrician, pedophilia. Pediatrician, pedia, paida, child doctor. Pedophilia, paida, phileo, love of a child. You get it now? Did it make your sense now? You see how, again, though New King James and all these other modern versions are translating the same Greek text. It's not a variant reading. It's the same Greek text. They've decided to translate the Greek words pais, paida, differently from the King James. And the Dewey Reigns, based on the Latin, translates it as son because the Latin translation understood pais, paida, referring to Jesus as the son. Now, if you disagree with me, that's between you and God. You can come to your own conclusion. But you see, now, let me bring up a related point. Let me bring up a related point. And then I hope you're not saying it to me, right? Because if I quote Jesus and the apostles and how they treated self-righteous, arrogant jerks and dogs who thought they were spiritual and humble, you're going to now pit Paul against Jesus and Paul against himself and Jesus against Jesus. All right, now, for the rest of you, pay attention and listen. For the rest of you, pay attention and listen. All right. Do you see the implication of the rise of modern versions? The implication is this. For over 300 years, the chief English translation for English-speaking Christians was the authorized version of the King James Bible. You know what that means, folks? According to modern scholars, if we take Daniel Wallace, James White, seriously, you know what that means? Can I tell you what the implication is? You know what that means? Does anyone understand the implication? That means that the triune God in his sovereignty was pleased to allow English-speaking Christians to use a version that wrongly translated Greek terms or included defective passages that shouldn't have been there citing them as thus saith the Lord, trusting that the translation was correct, and God allowed them to carry on in their ignorance for over 300 years. God bless you, Joanna. You understand the problem now? Now let's take it with the Catholics, Dewey Rames. Dewey Rames also, centuries was, the translation for Catholics of the Vulgate, right? I'm not saying Dewey Rames agrees with the King James in every place. There are times where they disagree. It goes with a short reading. But that also means that those Catholics who couldn't read Latin went with a translation that rendered these passages in a manner that we are now being told may have not been absolutely right. Because according to the Revised New Jerusalem Bible, New American Bible, Revised Edition, New Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, or Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, it should have been translated servant. And Acts 8.37 should not have been there. You get it now? You see what's at stake now? Now let me give you two more advantages of the King James translation. Two more. I'm not, I'm, I don't know much about Tyndale, but I know that his heart was to produce a readable translation of God's words so he can put it in the hands of the common person. And that is honorable and pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, let, let me give you two more that's really going to be quite interesting, okay? I just want to check something. Follow with me, guys. Let's go here. I just want to check something here. I want to surprise myself.
I want to surprise myself on that. Wow, the Dewey Rames did it again, man. Wow. Now, I was comparing. There are places with Dewey Rames differs with the King James, but they're very minor, if you ask me. In these places where, in my view, it matters, Dewey Rames agrees with the King James. Guys, I'm really impressed. I'm going to give you a link again, okay? Jesus in the Old Testament. How modern versions really mess things up for us because they decide to tell us what the word means, right? Are you ready? Here's the link. We're going to read together. Okay, we're going to read Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 8, guys. And I want you to pay attention to verse 8. New King James, King James and Dewey Rames. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 8. Are you ready? Who's ready? Let me know you're ready because you're going to click there and read with me. Click there and read with me. Okay, focus, guys. Oh, I put NIV? Okay, even better. NIV. Forgive me. Thank you. That's why I have people correcting me because I'm the closest thing to infallibility, but I'm not there yet. I'm working to get there. NIV. Thank you, sir. New International Version. Same thing. New International Version reads like the New King James Version. So NIV, even better. 2011 edition. Okay, let's read. We're going to read the King James Version. Hebrews 4, verses 1-8. He's going to recount the time of Moses and, and the Exodus. The Exodus from Egypt in the wilderness into the promised land. Pay attention. Let us therefore fear. Hebrews 4, verses 1-8. NIV, authorized King James Version, Dewey Rames. Comparing... And you can compare them for yourselves by going to BibleGateway.com for those who come later. BibleGateway.com gives you this feature. BibleGateway.com. They put them in parallel columns. Okay. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us entering into his rest. And any of you should, be, should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, those who came before us. But the word preach did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said. He, God said, as I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he, God again, spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. On this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, God saying, my covenant people entering my rest, I, God, my rest, God's rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in. They didn't enter God's rest because of unbelief. Again he... Pay attention to the, who the he is. He limiteth a certain day. He sets, sets apart a certain day, appoints a certain day, saying in David, God says in David through David, today after so long a time as it is said, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now pay attention to verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Now notice this. If Jesus had given them rest, if when he brought them into Canaan, that's when he gave them rest, then why would he then speak of another day? Let me explain what he means here. Let me explain what he means here. Okay, He's saying when Israel was brought into the land of Canaan, that was not the promised day of rest. You understand what he's saying? Be patient, sir. I'll get there. When the Israelites were brought into Canaan, that was not the promised day of rest. Because later on, through David, God mentioned another day. You understand what his argument? David is writing long after Israel entered Canaan, long after Israel settled in the land. And in Psalm 95, David speaks of today, if you hear his voice, do not harm your hearts. Because today is the day you enter his rest. You, you understand what he's saying? I can't make my point if you don't get 
the explanation. What the inspired author of Hebrews is saying is, Canaan was not the land of rest. When the Israelites entered Canaan, that was not God's rest day. Because when they entered Canaan, they did not rest. They rebelled, and God punished and destroyed them. And David, long after Israel settled in the land, speaks of today, if you hear his voice, do not harm your hearts, proving that when the Israelites entered Canaan, that's not the same as entering God's rest day. Everyone understand his point? God's rest day is not the land of Canaan. It's not the land of Israel. God's rest day is the day that you enter into by faith where then God grants you everlasting rest. Everyone got it? Before I move on? So let's read Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, 7 to 8 again. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now notice verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So now notice, King James says, Jesus. Watch here. Jesus. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Dewey Rames says Jesus. Watch here. Dewey Rames. Watch here. For if Jesus had given the rest, he would never have afterwards spoken of another day. Now, guys, who is the he who later spoke of another day through David? In this verse here, King James, Dewey Rames. Let's see who's going to catch it. For if Jesus had given them rest, he would never have afterwards spoken of another day. Who is he who spoke of another day through David long after Israel entered Canaan? According to these verses, Jesus. You understand what Hebrews just told you? It was our Lord Jesus Christ who brought Israel out of Egypt, brought them into Canaan, but did not give them rest because they rebelled against him. So Jesus then spoke through David of another day. You understand, according to King James and Dewey Rames, Jesus is the God who spoke through David, who spoke through Moses, and promised to give them a rest day. So Jesus is the one who spoke in Genesis 2, and Jesus is the one who spoke through David in Psalm 95, and Jesus is the God who through Moses brought them out of Egypt, but then punished them, for their unbelief, and brought them into the land of rest, and they still didn't experience rest because they didn't believe in him. And rebelled against them, so he destroyed them. Here's another passage that proves Jesus was there before he became man. He's the God of Moses, who brought them out of Egypt, was with them in the wilderness, and punished them for their unbelief, brought them into Canaan, and still didn't give them rest because they refused to believe, causing Jesus to punish them, so then Jesus inspired David to talk about another day. Yes, Jesus is the one who wrote the Ten Commandments. You caught it there? Not if you go with the modern versions like the NIV. The NIV destroy it for you by doing two things. Notice what the NIV did. NIV here. They did two things. They translated the Greek word Isus as Joshua and added the word God when the Greek doesn't have the word God. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There you go, NIV. So they did two things. They translated Isus as Joshua and inserted the word God when the word God is not in the Greek. Let me show you the Greek. See what's happening, folks? Now, I'll explain why they did it, Joshua, most translations, but I'll tell you why they're wrong. Here it goes. Folks, I want you to look at the Greek text. Here it is, the Greek text. Yeah, I'm going to get there, Moses. Just guys, be patient. If you're patient, I'll get there. Click on it. See what the Greek word is for Joshua. It's Jesus, right? 
Click on it. See if, if the word God is there. The word God is not there. And see if the Greek word is Isus, from which we get Jesus. Craig got upset. Craig got upset. I'm going to tell you why this is significant in a minute. Click on and see. Do you see that the Greek word is Isus, from which we get Jesus, and the word God is not there? The word God is not there? You see it? And the word God is not there. So now, why did they translate as Joshua? Why did NIV add the word God? Let me explain now. Are you ready to hear the explanation and tell you why they're wrong? And I'll tell you why they're wrong. I'll tell you why they're wrong. Okay. It is true that the Greek form of Joshua is Isus. Okay. It is true that Joshua of the Old Testament, his Greek name is Isus. So how do I how do we know that it's not talking about Joshua but Jesus our Lord and Savior? You know how I know? Because it says had Jesus given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. It cannot be Joshua who spoke of another day through David cuz Joshua's dead and he doesn't inspire prophets. So it has to be Jesus Christ. You get my point? That's how I know it's not Joshua. Let me show you the Dewey Rames again. Let me show you. So well, guess what the NIV did? In the NIV decided to tell you what it means. You watch here. Here's the Dewey Rames. For if Jesus had given them rest, he, Jesus, would never have afterwards spoken of another day. How can it be Joshua... Speaking of another day later on through David, when David came centuries after Joshua died. So it can't be Joshua, right? It has to be Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence, right? Right? Yep. It has to be Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence, right? So guess what the NIV did? NIV realized to translate as Joshua would be a problem because if we go with their rendering, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he, Joshua, would not have spoken another day. So guess what they did to resolve the problem? They inserted the word God to change it. So instead of them translating, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have spoken another day. They decided to change the pronoun into a noun. For if Joshua had given them rest, then God, in order for you not to assume that Joshua is the one who spoke of another day because they knew Joshua died. It could not have been him. So they insert and decided to insert the word God and explain it all for you. I'm not aware of that, Kedus. Because Jesus' name in Hebrew would be the same as Joshua. Come on, Tarun. I love you, man. Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua from Yehoshua. And Joshua is the English translation of Yehoshua. So how do you translate Yehoshua, Yeshua into Greek? Yesus. Because they have the same name in Hebrew. Right? You see what modern versions are doing to us, guys? See what's doing to us? And let me tell you why it's a travesty and a perversion of the text. Because if you guys paid attention, I don't know if you paid attention. In Hebrews 4, 2 and 6, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 and 6, it says, the people of Moses had the gospel preached to them. You understand the implication? Paul is telling you Jesus was there preaching the gospel to Moses and the Israelites. Jesus appeared to them and preached the gospel to them, but they were condemned because they did not believe the gospel. That's the point of Paul, and he's warning us. Like they rejected Jesus and his gospel and were destroyed, you better not reject Jesus now and his gospel or you'll be destroyed. That's what he's saying in Hebrews 4.
In fact, here, do me a favor. First, last post Hebrews 4, 4. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 2 and verse 6. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 2 and 6. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left of uh, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Unto them. They had the gospel preached to them as it's preached to us. Did you catch it? They in the Old Testament, Moses and Israel, had the gospel preached to them. But the, wor the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now verse 6, verse 6, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Did you catch it? That's King James. They had Jesus preach the gospel to them, saying, If you believe in me, you'll enter my rest, and I'll give you everlasting rest. They refused to believe, but they rebelled against him, and he destroyed them. That same Jesus is now preaching the gospel to us. You can enter my rest too and experience everlasting rest if you believe, but don't do what they did, who heard me preach and then <clears throat> denied the gospel, rebelled against me, so I had to destroy them, and I'll do the same to you. You see what now, when you let the text speak, what you find in New Testament is the consistent theme. Jesus Christ preached the gospel in the Old Testament before he became man. Because he was there appearing to them, actively involved in their lives, appearing to them, speaking to them, saving them, preaching to them and condemning them because they did not believe in him but rebelled. And that same Jesus is doing it today and will continue to do it till the end of the age. And if you guys don't believe me, Galatians 3.8. Galatians 3.8. Who else had the gospel preached to him? Galatians 3 verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Do you guys believe that? Preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, Indeed, shall all nations be blessed. Do you guys believe it? The gospel was being preached from the beginning after the fall of Adam and Eve. You guys believe that? Do you believe your New Testament? And who preached the gospel to Abraham? John 8, 56 to 59. No, it's the same gospel. John 8, 56 to 59. Here you go. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Abraham wanted to see me and saw him, and I saw him, he saw me. He loved me, he was elated to see me, and I saw him. You got it, Nori Davis. I want to kiss your head. Always been the same. So do you understand the significance? Of course, Joe, that Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their Savior, their Creator, the one who loves them, the one who will save them and provide for them and sustain them, and the one who would come to be their seed, to redeem the world. And you find the gospel of God sending his son to be crucified in Genesis 22 when Abraham offered his son Isaac. I just did a session on it recently. A picture of the father and the son in our redemption. Right? Now let me give you another example of how your translations will affect our view of Jesus. Now let me again put it in perspective so you guys 
don't misunderstand me. All modern versions translate up to translate the same text over 90% of the time. Meaning among the extent Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic manuscripts of the Bible and various versions, they agree over 90% of the time. So all modern versions are translating the same text over 90% of the time, which is why you get the NIV, you'll get the same message. Trinitarianism, Jesus is a God-man, salvation by grace through faith in Christ, apart from works we do, empowered by the Spirit to then do works, Right? To show our union with Christ and to cling to Christ and remain in union with him. So don't misunderstand me. All modern Bible versions are translating the same text over 90% of the time because the extent manuscript tradition agrees over 90% of the time as a testimony to God's faithfulness in preserving his words and making sure the church had access to God's words in a correct, accurate manner. Right? But with that said, there are those differences that are significant in determining what version you want to follow. Yes, I have an article on that gaming stuff. Ask me to give you the link. I have an article on that gaming stuff. Ask me to give you the link. I may have to do a part two on this about Israel because it's almost two hours. And I promise you, Lord willing, I'll talk about Israel and its role in salvation, redemptive history, and the coming of Christ. I'll do it, I promise you. But I may just have to park it on here. But now, follow with me. Follow with me. Let me give you another example. Okay, you want that link? Genesis 5, the gospel in Genesis 5? All right, here you go. The names and the genealogy pointing to Jesus Christ, the gospel. It's a long one, so you're going to have to read it. Because I have to give... Links showing that these names mean what I show they mean. Here it is. The relation of the gospel in Adam's genealogy, Genesis 5. I define the names in the genealogy, and then I give a very lengthy section where I quote specific sources showing this is what the names mean. Lest someone accuses me of mistranslating the names. Here it goes, guys. The relation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Adam's genealogy. There it is. Save it. Study it. Use it. Okay, now, everyone else, following with me? See, so this is what I do, guys. I believe that the Holy Spirit confirmed my heart to embark on full-time ministry in the year 1999. And ever, ever since then, I've been doing full-time ministry, trusting God's goodness to stir up people to support. And that's what I do. Study, research, analyze, listen to detractors of the faith, and listen to a variety of opinions and seeking the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth so that I can bring all this information together for your benefit. And I pray that God will continue to empower me to do it until he takes me home because I don't want to do anything else but serve the Lord and his church out of love for Jesus. Yep, no greater job than this. And thank the Lord for COVID-19 and Internet. You know why? Because of COVID-19, we're forced to now listen to sermons online. And because of the internet and God opening the door that no man can shut, where we can use the internet like YouTube, we're reaching millions all over the world for the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise Him. All these blessings that we take advantage of. And may the Lord keep us pure and in love with him and save us from our flesh in Jesus' name. Okay, one more example. Catherine, you can send to my PayPal page or Patreon. Either one, the links will be provided in the description box or here. Thank you, Prophet Google. Okay, now, one more example. An example that is very subtle in that if you don't pay attention, you won't see its significance in affirming the Trinity. Okay, you ready for a final example? Final example. Let me see. Okay, let me show you this. An affirmation of the Trinity. Here I'm going to compare the King James with the NIV. Okay, here's the link. Here's the link. Here's the link. 
Hebrews 1 3. Let's see the discerning reader who's going to catch it. Who's going to catch it? Hebrews 1 3. I'm going to read King James Version. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Let me read it again. Hebrews 1 3, King James Version, compared with NIV, the two bestsellers. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. NIV, let's see who's going to catch it. And how this shows impacts the Trinity. Both versions will give you the Trinity. Not saying they won't. But one gives it much more powerfully in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 1.3, NIV. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. One more time. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Who caught the difference? Who caught the difference? Michelle, I want to kiss your head. But if you're married, I can't. I don't want your husband to think I'm hitting on you. Di hiautu. Di hiautu is the Greek. I checked it up to see. Yep, Jake got it. Jake got it. And Michelle got it. The difference is Hebrews 1.3 says, who by himself made purification of sins. Who by himself, di hiautu, made purification of sins. NIV doesn't have those two words. Di hiautu. You know why that's important? Who by himself. Did anyone help Jesus purge our sins, purify our sins, or he did it all by himself? Hebrews 1.3, King James says, who by himself. That phrase by himself is not in the modern versions. Okay? It's not in the modern versions. Oscar, I've been making a case for the King James. I don't know if you're aware of it. Here it is. When he had by himself purged our sins, when he had by himself, hold on, purged our sins. Yep, that's what I've been doing, Oscar. When he had by himself purged our sins. You know why? That's powerful. Because now, folks, let's go to King James rendering. Now watch the Trinitarian Implication of Hebrews 9.14. NIV, King James. Hebrews 9.14. NIV, King James. I may have a customer, a heretic, who thinks the name Asus is the name for the devil. I may call him if you're interested. Hebrews 9.14. How much more, King James, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. NIV, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Okay, guys, King James says, Jesus by himself, purged our sins. But then in Hebrews 9.14, it says, Jesus purged our conscience in union with the eternal spirit. Notice the Trinity here. Jesus, the eternal spirit, God the Father. Jesus in union with the eternal spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working with Jesus, offered himself to God the Father to purge our sins. There's the Trinity right there. But you understand how Hebrews 1.2 makes the Trinity stick out more powerfully? Because if Jesus did it by himself, 
But then it says he did it through the eternal spirit. Then it means when Jesus did it by himself, he did it by himself when it comes to creatures. No creature helped Jesus. When it comes to creation, he did it by himself, proving the eternal spirit is not a creature, but he must be God. Otherwise, you have a contradiction. You see how the King James brings the deity of the Holy Spirit to the forefront much more clearly. How can Jesus purge our sins in union with the eternal spirit? How can the eternal spirit be working with Christ to purge our sins when it says Jesus did it by himself, which means in respect to creation, no creature helped him. In respect to creation, he did it by himself without any creature. But then it says he did it in union with the eternal spirit because the eternal spirit is not a creature, folks. That's why he's said to be eternal because he's uncreated, one with the Son in essence and nature. So it is true that Jesus did it by himself in respect to creation. No creature helped him. But he did it in union with the Spirit because the Spirit is no creature. The Spirit is eternal and therefore one with the Father and Son and deity. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Hebrews 9.14 by itself is a Trinitarian passage. But when you add Hebrews 1.3 in the King James rendering, it makes the Trinitarian implication of the passage much more stronger. Notice three and only three persons again. Not a fourth, not a fifth. Here, Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, that's God the Father, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Notice, Christ, the eternal spirit, and God, meaning God the Father. And then when you add the King James or in Hebrews 1.3, Christ purged our sins by himself. And later on, the author will say, he did it in union with the eternal spirit. Did it sink in? So the spirit is eternal. He's not a creature. He's almighty God, one with the father and the son. Did it sink in? Let me see if this guy wants to talk now. I may be wasting my time, guys. Don't get upset at me if I block him, hang up on him, because he's one of these weirdos who thinks that the word Isus is the name of Lucifer. Okay, so let's see. Let me see. If I'm wasting my time, I'm going to hang up on him. Yeah. He's got a YouTube channel. See, everyone thinks they're, they're scholars. Let me see what he's going to say. Yeah, folks, I'm going to have to, I'll do the topic about Israel tomorrow. I may take a few questions because it's almost two hours. So I'll real, I will retitle this. The Trinity, Jesus, and Bible versions. Let's see if he's going to say yes. Right? Yeah, Jake, because it's going to indicate that some of the earliest witnesses do not have by himself. Which brings up another question. Which brings up another question. Let me ask you another question. Let's say the words di hiautu in Hebrews 1.3. Guys, pay attention to this question, all right? I want you to listen to understand the implication. Let's say those words by himself, di hiautu, found in the King James, were added later by scribes, and they were not part of the original text that Paul wrote or used the scribe to write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's say... Modern versions are right. Those words by himself were not part of the original text. Are you with me there? Understand what I'm going to ask you. Let's go with it. Who allowed the translators of the King James and those before them to translate from Greek manuscripts 
that had the words by himself producing and mass producing a Bible for English speaking Christians that became the chief Bible for all English speaking Christians the world over for 300 years. So that to this day, it's a bestseller where English speaking Christians read those words, believing it's part of the inspired text, thinking the spirit inspired them only to discover many of them didn't because they died thinking it's inspired that those words were added later. You see the problem? When you denigrate the King James, like many trans, many people do, like James White, even though he says, no, it's a good trend. No, he doesn't mean that. If he thought it's a good translation, he wouldn't try to write books, getting people to lose their faith in the King James and go with modern versions, because his book affected me negatively. All right, if it's good, then let, let's just stick with it. No, because he wants you to read other versions. So don't believe that. Don't believe that. Okay? But now, folks, this means according to these critics, God allowed an English translation to be mass produced because with the rise of the printing press, you can now mass produce Bibles and put in the hands of the common person, mass produce Bibles and distribute them in the millions all over the world. A Bible that became the chief translation for English speaking Christians for over 300, 300 years until this day is the best-selling translation, most read, along with the NIV, that contains defective readings that are inspired, and God allowed that. And you see why your position destroys faith and produces Bart Ehrmans, who abandoned faith in the Bible altogether? So how did I come to believe that the King James is God's perfect words in English, even though I don't have answers to all the objections? There are a lot of objections that are good I can't answer. Because my trust in God's goodness, God is real, he is almighty, he is good, he is faithful, and will work in time and space in such a way to make sure Christians don't adopt the wrong manuscripts to translate from in order to dupe Christians. That's the same reasoning that led me now to fully embrace the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Assyrian Church of the East, and the Coptic Church, and their beliefs, such as the perpetual virginity of Mary, Communion of Saints, the Eucharist, because the same reasoning led me to the conclusion, hold on. If these are doctrines that were widespread and universal and believed before the church split, that means God must be pleased with these doctrines. They cannot be false. They cannot be damnable. They can't be contrary to Scripture. That same reasoning led me to that conclusion. You get it now? Anyway, folks, God willing, don't forget tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The former Seventh-day Adventist, who was a Seventh-day Adventist for 30 years, is going to go live with me. He doesn't want his face to be seen or his name known. He's going to be quoting from Ellen G. White's works proving she's a false prophetess, a tool of Satan, and not of God, and therefore proving the seven-day Adventists or that seven-day Adventist church is a cult. It's a false church. We need to pray for people to leave it for the glory of Jesus Christ. So tomorrow, 1 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, Michigan Time, and then God willing, I'll do a session on Israel and the church. I can't do it now. It's already been two hours. And it's midnight for me, and it's 3 a.m. 3 for first class. He needs to rest. Guys, if I've been a blessing to you, then covenant with me. Pray that the Lord Jesus will keep my daughters and I in love with him, holy unto the Lord. Pray the Lord Jesus will save me from temptation and my flesh. Pray the Lord Jesus will keep them healthy and give me the health to see them grow up, to be in love with the Lord if the Lord tarries. Pray the Lord Jesus will provide for us and pray for a miracle that Jesus will destroy the satanic union between their mother and this ungodly relationship with Martin, this wicked, adulterous relationship, so that my daughters will be free, their mother will repent, and that I'll have them in my arms.
putting them to sleep, waking up with them again in Jesus' name. Pray, God, give me favor with the locals here. Set me free from all these restrictions and make me a man of integrity and not to prostitute myself for fame or fortune. Pray the Lord Jesus will increase in me and in us and bless the ministry, bless the sessions, and bless these articles. And you have my permission. Upload them, translate them, make clips out of them, <clears throat> print my articles. It's all free for the glory of Jesus. And my, may I continue to love you for the glory of Jesus until the Lord takes me home. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. He is almighty to save. He is Yahweh, Yahovah in the flesh, the eternal heart of the Father, eternal companion of the Spirit, the one God whom we love and worship, who's in love with us. Amen. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. See you, Lord willing, with the session with the Seventh-day Adventist.